I've been 30 odd, but Matt will know. I think we give it a bit longer and then people might just be, give it a few more minutes. Sure. Hi um, folks. Hey Matt. Sorry about that. Never have a toddler, ever. I was gonna say, isn't he in bed? It's really late. Not at all, no, not at all. What's his time, his bedtime? Uh, you know, 10.30, no, I'm joking. But nine o'clock. I was um, I was just reading my sister's children to uh, before she she had to go out to the shop. So I was like, it's like quarter two, you know. <laughs> so I was going to be late. So we're here. Hi everybody. Thanks for your patience, everybody. I think we can probably go ahead and get started, and then. Um, People can join us or we can post the recording for afterwards if it's okay with everybody if we uh, record. Thank you everybody. And welcome to uh, Deja Vu, it feels like, You're not in a good way, unfortunately. Uh, we were here last Thursday talking about Rosh and now we're here this Thursday talking about WAVE and what this means overall um, for HD research. Um, um, so, yeah, uh, so those of you who weren't familiar with it, um, the WAVE Life of Sciences announced uh, on Monday, I believe it was, that, um, that their uh, Precision 1 and Precision HT2 trials both stopping, both of those drugs have proved not to lower uh, mutant Huntington. Um, I'm saying this like I know what I'm talking about, I don't really, but and that's why we've got our wonderful uh, guests and colleagues here. So we've got, uh, we've got Heather and Lauren who've joined us. Lauren we had on last week, um, but Heather also um, until recently worked at UCL, you've, you've changed now, right? But, uh, yeah, uh, but both have a lot of experience in HG research and both are family members as well. So thank you to both of you. And of course, we've got Hayley as well here. And we're going to be talking, if you've got questions, just put them away. But we're going to be talking a bit about WAVE first, and then we'll talk a little bit about where this leaves HG research in general. Because um, I think we're all feeling a bit rough after this uh, past couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, uh, Lauren, maybe you want to just kind of say a bit about what's happened with WAVE in the past few days? Sure, um, I'll just introduce as well myself. Um, uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, um, I'm Lauren Byrne and I'm a, a postdoc research fellow at the Huntington C Centre at UCL, uh, working with Ed Wild. Um, and I in a year or two ago, I joined the board of trustees for HDO and have been working at co-chairing their research committee, which was newly formed last year. Um, my research is focused on what we call biofluid biomarkers. So um, I know a lot about the tools that they use to um, measure this Huntington protein in the spinal fluid that they talked about in this wave trial. Uh, which we can talk a bit about more, but I'll let maybe Heather introduce herself a bit first. Hi, I'm Heather, and like Lauren, I'm also a um, postdoc. Well, actually, today is my last day, but I um, have been for the last two years, and um, before that, it was my PhD, and before that, was my master's, so it's been a while. Um, my work is specifically on ASOs. Um, and the met our model is brain cells and it's been a nice project all along but i think it's the emphasis that we are still learning so um although it's a total disappointment it's still something that we can go on so fingers crossed for onwards and upwards great uh, thanks guys so we can start kind of a bit on maybe ASO. So Heather, as she says, has been working in ASOs. So we could probably give an overview of that first. I know a lot of people heard some of this last week with the Bosch trial, which was also a ASO drug. 
Um, but basically, and ASO is short for a antisense oligonucleotides. Um, and what these are, are um, uh, synthetically designed DNA, single-stranded DNA molecules. So they've been purposely designed to be specific to certain parts of um, the Huntington message that is used to make the Huntington protein in our cells. Um, and we were particularly, were unique in terms of their approach in, into Huntington lowering in that they were very, were trying to selectively target the bad copy. So going back to kind of our understanding of Huntington's disease, you have a bad copy and a good copy of the gene. Um, if you if you carry the mutation, that is, um, and but your your body produces both the good and the or uses the good and the bad, to, and that ends up having the what we call the mutant Huntington protein or the bad Huntington protein that causes all the damage to cells um, and our neurons. Um, but we still have the good copy, which is as we know from lots of research that's gone before. Huntington is extremely important for the human brain and particularly in brain development it's less understood its role um, in adult brains um, so I'm sure Heather can say a bit more about this in terms of way of specific approach but they you'll hear things called SNPs or pronounced SNPs but they're short it says SMP which stands for um, single Nucleotide polymorphism. Nucleotide polymorphism. <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys um, are struggling with it. I mean, I just, it's a lot, long time since I actually had to say it. <laughs> Molecular biology. <laughs> I mean, you don't really need to know the real word. All you need to know is when you know with genetics, it's all based on these single letters with a combination of four letters that fills up the whole genome and the DNA um, that fills up our whole genome. Um, but it's the combinations of these that uh, are build are used to make the building blocks for the that make these proteins. And we all have um, different, yeah. different letters, and yeah, that's what Wave was working on. That their first one and two was up to sixty percent of the HD population had these specific letters that would allow them target just mutant, and um, that. That was on the basis that our first idea of ASOs was let's reduce Huntington as a whole because we found out that if we reduce the wild type or the healthy version that we can tolerate this to a certain degree and that we didn't have any adverse effects if we lowered the whole the whole lot of it but realistically as Lauren said we do need this wild type Huntington it's we we know we can't really live without it and um, our cells acquire it it's you know, we need it when we're in utero and it's just very important. So obviously your, your goal is that you do not want to um, like to mess with something that's good. So our whole overall goal is for a wave then would be if you just target the mutant or the bad form, then you're not altering anything else or causing any other consequences. You're just focusing on the main problem. Mm -hmm. That was the whole idea then behind the one and two is that between these two drugs, either one or both of them for the population, it would reach up to 60%, which was great. And they did show that a dose dependent decrease, um, which is what you do want to see in clinical trials and based on how drugs work, is that if, depending how much you give, you should have less and less and less of what you're targeting. So the mutant Huntington. So the more drug you give, the less Huntington you have. And I think HD Buzz did a great article there and or they even did one in January about the wave uh, results. And it's important that you don't compare it to Roche because they are, although the ASOs are actually two very different studies and they're doing actually two very different things. So I, I don't think like we can use this to compare them, like definitely to understand ASOs and the more this happens, the more we learn about them, but they're not a comparable. It's a really bad coincidence that it's two in two weeks, but I, I don't think it's a, it's not linked to the ASOs. So that's at least 
Yeah, yeah, it's two different reasons that we're coming here today. So last week was to do with um, the that trial was looking at benefit uh, versus risk of the long term treatment of a drug, which had previously showed that it can lower Huntington. Um, these two drugs, the precision or the in the two trials, precision one and two, part of the wave program, um, didn't manage to show enough Huntington lowering. Um, so, which was their target. And at that stage of the study, what we call phase one A to B, which was all about saying that they could, the two B part was about making sure that they could hit that target, um, which that's what they failed to do. And that's what this result is all about. But it's not end of hope either because we have they have a third candidate that is about to go into human trials, which is yeah, also show that this there wasn't the safety concern. So although yes, we didn't reach the so this is I think a really big important thing in research and any clinical trials that we have this instinct of being like any result that we don't want is negative and bad and you know we throw it in the bin. But actually, that's the whole foundation of how we can do better next time. So as, mm -hmm. as much as we don't like these results, they are going to help. Like, so we already know that this delivery method, we didn't have any adverse safety concerns or, you know, really bad symptoms from it. So that's already like a tick for the next one. We don't have to waste time checking to see if this is going to, you know, this delivery method is okay because we know that that's fine. So like with the wave three, like this is more optimistic because it is a different backbone and what this means is that how the ASO is made and how you deliver it so it's going to be the same idea it's going to be you know the letters of DNA that bind to the mutant Huntington and then cause it to be degraded or basically just thrown out of the cell which is what we want um wave three is up to 40 percent of the HD population as far as I remember someone correct me if I got that wrong but I think it's 40 percent so, um, so less of the, less the, of the population, yeah. but not necessarily a bad thing because with the new chemistry, it's probably better to start off with a specific, so SNPs, what Lauren said previously, we all have slightly different ones. So this specific one they're using is 40%. But if this ASO does get further, then they'll already have that structure made mm -hmm. and they can change the letters to match the SNPs for the other 60%. Okay. So, a bit more so just to be clear, the 40% the is the amount of the, is thought to be the amount of HG population that would carry, has these SNPs in their Huntington gene that allows them to be candidate or eligible for this drug. So um, otherwise, if they don't have it, the, the SNP wouldn't target the Huntington and lower it select, uh, selectively. Yeah, and that's exactly right that um, I know candidates from wave one and two will be offered if they want to have a screen to see if these they have this specific letter that allows them to be eligible for wave three. So that's already something. And with the backbones, I've gone through two sets of ASOs in my specific job. And what we're looking for is we're seeing, so we know that their method is good and we know that they bind, but how they're delivered and how they're made affects that. So this new backbone that they're making should make it bind better, more stronger, and not just like, you know, wander off and bind to other things that it shouldn't. So that's, that's the most complicated part for the research is that we don't know how efficient backbones are until we get to this, this far. So I, like my disease model was brain cells. So we have them in a dish. And what we do is we deliver the ASO in the cell's food. And they uptake it. And then we test whether Huntington, I do while I do global. So we, ours wasn't selective to mutant. And then we just measure if it goes up or goes down based on the ASO. And we do know it works. We do know we can reduce Huntington, but it's how we get from here to a human body and all of our little differences between everybody and how this drug acts in all of us. and. The, the older backbones, although they promoted the, or the, I don't know how you say it, the putting in the bin of the, the Huntington, um, 
that helped that, but it didn't help them bind. So it helped the mechanism work really well, but it wasn't the most optimal way to help the ASO to bind to the DNA. Yeah, it couldn't grab hold of it very tightly to be able to put it in the bin. Yeah, so this is why like this new, this new backbone uh, enhances it. So it's like a better, you know, those um, things you use like the fly catchers or like the litter picker uppers, mm -hmm. like, like snaps, mm -hmm. so it'll snap onto it much better. And then it will cause all the other. And um, if I could, I have a little diagram of how ASOs work, if that helps. Yeah, oh, that would be good. Be helpful, yeah, yeah, yeah. Show your screen. Um, just to kind of jump on that as well, I think it's important to think of a few things that affect the effectiveness of a drug, and particularly ASOs, in when it gets to the human stage. That is why it's it's very hard, I think, to really tran. It, it has been so hard to translate from animal models and, and cell models to the brain. And you do have that question mark when we go into human studies. Um, so it, there's the ability of an ASO to get into the cells in the first place. And the chemistry is gonna affect that. The chemistry of the backbone as Heather was talking about is gonna either improve that or not. And then again, it's that whether it can target Huntington specifically and how closely it sticks to Huntington to do that work. And, and um, yeah, so, and then how long it lasts in terms of um, how stable it is as a molecule without mm. doing its job. So there's a few different things that the chem this chemistry could affect and improve. And that's why they're very positive about their new chemistry and why um, it should help. Um, and that's why they're positive by going forward with this new candidate. Yeah. Think, are they being positive or are they just kind of saying, okay, well, <laughs> we've got our fingers crossed or are they genuinely feeling more positive about oh, version no, three? Definitely. definitely. Like, and they this, are definitely being, yeah. yeah. Can you, can you see the slide back? This will probably help answer that question. We can yes. see the slides. Yeah. So I can't, maybe if I, okay, everyone ignore everything apart from the bottom left, where it says Ionis. Can mm. everyone see that? Just focus on that. But yeah. I on a slide from one of my um, departmental meetings. But what we're looking at here is the ASO in the, I say dark red, purple. Um, and this is its letters, the four letters, the combination. And the orange line is our Huntington. So what it does is it's an exact sequence and it binds exactly to the same sequence in Huntington and it causes this like bubble effect. So once it latches on uh, this molecule called RNase H, it senses this and it's attracted to it. And what it does is once these two um, sequences bind together, because one is, so the ASO is DNA and the Huntington is RNA. And when you have this hybrid, it's called a hybrid. So two different things bind together. It attracts the RNase H this eating molecule and it causes it to break apart the Huntington so that it can't be made into the protein. So what they're doing now for wave three is that the backbone, or you see that the, the little letters beside the big letters. So the big letters is the exact sequence in Huntington. The little letters are how it's made up. So that these snips or the backbone are how it's made. And what they do is that the more we learn about the backbones and how it binds, the more efficient this process will be. So this new, it's called the PN backbone. What it will do is it will bind better to the Huntington sequence more efficiently and make sure that this reaction occurs properly without having any stragglers or wanderers. So this is making it basically more potent, not in terms of toxicity or anything like that, but it's just doing its job much better. And that's the whole idea of why it is. a It's a negative outcome, the fact that you know, no one wants to see a chemical trial stop, but it's positive to the fact that the ASOs are only going to get better. And once yeah. You, yeah, you have to just keep fine tuning the mechanism. And the only way we can do that is through the clinical trials. And what it tells us is, and just to clarify for everyone, I know we've said it last week as well, but when we say, oh, this gives us learning, this gives us hope by Heather's diagram, I really hope you can see that that set of little letters, either side of the big letters, you know, they hold on more tightly. It really depends. There's so many letters we can, well, there's not so many letters as well, but we, there's letters we can choose from and they can hold on more tightly or hold on less tightly depending on which order of letters we use. 
you know, if you're, if you're on your phone in a keypad, there's lots of different sequences you can enter your four digit pin in. So there's lots, you know, there's lots of ways this will teach us so much on how they can be made better. So I hope that helps explain why wave three will probably be better. And I think it's actually really, really, I know it doesn't seem for like a lot of people really fast, but like we're still working with ASOs in the lab directly, like right now, and we're still learning about it. But yeah, there's already ones in clinical trials being tested on patients. So for me, that seems really, really fast, considering it, I've only had them and I've only gotten a new backbone very recently that I, like we didn't know about it. That's just being developed. So I, I know it's a bit, I suppose, uh, a bias because I'm in the lab, but it does give me so much hope about how, well, one, how much we're working on them, like how much our whole team are really driving these projects to, to really see how these ASOs are going to do what we want them to do, which is ultimately lower the protein, you know, and help HG patients. It's all like our work is for. So as annoying as this is, like I'm a big believer of negative results big believer in it but that means no one else is wasting their time doing that again you know mm -hmm. you can only, only get some answers from it and I always find you answer one question and you make another 10 from it so this is that this is exactly that we have the mechanism but we need to make it better so I think uh, go ahead go ahead oh, Matt. sorry I have a question uh, from my own stupid self here um so and obviously you might not be able to say too much about this but why then did Roche's treatment work in the sense that it stopped, it lowered mutant Huntington right in the spine, but waves did not? Why, what happened there? Well, this is the whole, this is the point of like what I said in this call. We can't, we cannot compare those two trials. They are separate. The ASOs from two different companies are going to be made differently. There is Huntington is massive. So the sequences, the letters that they're choosing are going to be different. Okay. There's, there's also the fact that by having to do the selective approach, they are so much more limited to the ASOs and, and, and forms that they can use to, to selectively. They have to be very, very specific on the sequence. So it makes it very harder, much harder to create a molecule. Um, so they have have to do, do a lot more iterations where you, when you don't when you're not trying to target a specific short little sequence um but something just generally specific to Huntington it gives you a lot more to work with so it means you know you don't have to screen as many candidates that fail you know, because of the selectivity reasons and you can go with the most potent one so I think that's a factor the major also um it could be the you know understanding the design and the preclinical stuff whether they had a, a good enough model to get dosing right um yeah it's there's a lot of things but they did increase the dose and that seems to not have improved the signal or the readout for the huntington lowering so and it, you know there is a caveat of what we're measuring in csf hunt huntington um and what that looks like in the brain. At the minute, we are there are tools that are being developed to take pictures of the brain and take, hunt, take pictures of where the Huntington is in the brain, which will be super informative for these kind of studies to, to really translate, well, what does the level of Huntington in the brain mean, or in the CSF that, that they are using in these trials at the minute as a readout? What, does that really mean in terms of how much lowering is going on in the brain and where? Um, because at the minute we're basing these off models from um, preclinical work right up to kind of large pig models of Huntington's disease, which have a big brain, but it's still a lot smaller than a human brain. And, and there's a lot to kind of, to learn still about what's, what, how, how much did these ASOs penetrate into the brain? Um, where did they lower, um, how much in different regions. So we know they're definitely lowering in the CSF, but we don't know what is happening in the brain tissue, which is the important bit. And I agree with Lauren about that's probably one of the biggest points is that the wave um, drugs are so limited because what makes us all different, we have to try find what's actually common between all of us at one region 
which is very difficult to do. And a problem with our DNA is, although it's four letters, if you have too much of certain letters, um, molecules don't like binding to them. So they can be like sticky or, or non-sticky for the case. Like a lot, of, a lot of repeated letters actually cause problems because it causes the molecule to slip. It doesn't know where to bind. So there's a lot of complications down at the, at the letter level. And when you're already so limited to try find letters that are common to the mutant in as many people as possible, and then create a molecule around that. So ideally it's the better strategy because you just want to take the mutant away, but it's much more hard work. Whereas Ross, who are targeting hunting tin, the big lad, doesn't can actually, doesn't have limits on where it should bind. It's bind, it's based on how optimal the drug is. So they can really focus on the best letter sequence for that drug, instead of having all the complications of how many people have these letters and are they in the right place? And that's a really big difference. Okay. That's very interesting. I think I'm following you. That's good. <laughs> um, if you do have Coach, questions. She's good. <laughs> she is Yeah, good. we'd love to hear any questions. Yeah. If you have questions, keep bringing them in. It's totally fine. Um, I have another stupid question from myself. If you, if you have, no, yes, have another so one. Stupid. And there's no question. Yeah, there's no, no stupid, stupid questions. questions. But, you yeah. wait and see. You wait and see. What this got. is complicated <laughs> science. There's no stupid yeah. questions. It really, it's really complicated. Sure, I can even say sniff. So um, it's all fine. I'm like, I'm like talking is... the protein in the bin. Can't think of better word. Great. Like, so you're fine. Uh, no, so I'm really just kind of thinking from. Uh, because obviously for myself, not, not scientific at all, um, just read the others article, but me trying to understand what's happening with these trials and why they've not worked is very difficult. And obviously you guys are in the labs and working on these things. And I assume you're talking about these things and you know talking about the progress of these studies and these trials. Are you guys expecting like, were you guys expecting good results from Wash and Wave, or were you thinking that there's probably a chance it's not going to happen? No, I think. No, me, I wasn't. Yeah. The idea that what we are doing is going to work. Like, there's no yeah. way we would put the amount of effort and hours into something we think. Like, first of all, you'd never put something into a patient that you're like, this is going to work. You know, our mm. first thing is always safety, always. And if, it's safe then your next step is okay the body can handle this it might be able to do its job like i have never worked on a project to expect it not to work like and all we do is troubleshoot to make sure it does as best as it can what i would say is my expectation of what working is it, it has been maybe more um maybe less optimistic than maybe what patients are could be uh, 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 more, <laughs> um, to like the excitement of science scientists mm -hmm. it's something I've, I've tried to do over the last year or two when I do talk to patients and family members is try and kind of I don't want to dampen their hope but it's just making it realistic you know being able to slow Huntington's down over two years is a win um but that might not look like look or feel like that to anybody participating in that trial. They will they yeah. will still get worse, but it might be slower. And how mm -hmm. we detect that and the thing with the rush. So my I wasn't expecting the rush to stop at when it did. I, I didn't think it was going to be a huge benefit in terms of stopping the disease in its tracks, or but I thought it would perhaps slow it down, which would have been a huge win for the community as our first as a starting point for yeah, other drugs step. to come. Yeah. Um, and that's, but the thing is, we don't, we really don't know what happened there. And the data is that Rosh finally have the data and they're going to be, it's going to be coming out. Um, and it's going to be such a big learning curve because that trial was 800 participants worldwide. And there's so much data on these patients. Um, and no matter what, it's going to be hugely informative for the field and for our understanding of Huntington lowering and ASOs um, and you know, intrathecal studies. So there's going to be a lot of gained and 
one thing I can say about you know Roche and working with them, the way they designed the study, they really left no stone unturned. So there will be so much information to gain from that. Um, and then with Wave, I what I wasn't hugely shocked um, based on the fact that they gave released their top line results in December, and it didn't seem to have a huge effect on Newton Huntington then. But I knew they were. Um, uh adding a higher dose um so i think it was the shock was the timing of it and having to be after last week so mm -hmm. um it was a real tough blow for for all of us um, i think that's really important though what lauren said um and matt especially like you'll understand probably this more that like my time frames for how science work are very delayed in terms of when we're in the lab we know things you know, they don't work instantly because you have to troubleshoot and find the best way and make sure that you want to do it, it will work. And I understand from clinical trials and from patients, like when they hear, or when everyone hears of a treatment, you think, ah, done, sign seal delivered. And and I, I, I get that, I get that. But I, it's really hard to like translate that. What we think is really quick is years for you and vice versa that we're or, or any small developments we find we think are massive, but don't translate across because it's not a direct treatment, but it's it's leading us there. So we're like, oh, a really big goal. You know, we found this out. But until we can get it into a clinical trial, it's very hard for you to, to see the advances that are happening. And I think, mm -hmm. I think that's really hard. And I think that's why I think like Matt with HGYO and when we do more, I think the educational stuff of like getting people to see what goes on in labs it will only help realize how much progression there actually is to get this far and how much it takes to just get to a clinical trial like that's already an achievement and though the biggest goal is obviously to have treatment but we want one that will work like we're not going to settle for a you know second best or it will do mm, yeah. like that's never going to be the case so as fast as like i think this was super quick like how far an ASO got to a clinical trial and how quick it happened, I can totally understand how everyone else feels the opposite because people are waiting for it and want it. And like everything, yeah. it does like distort how you think about it and how disappointing these results are. And, and they are, but they're not the end. Like they'll only just get better. So I think so that's, yeah. That's we, have, we have a question from Leslie. Um, so she's asked, basically kind of just touching on what you're talking about there is, is it unrealistic to expect to cure Huntington's? Should we instead hope for a suite of treatments to turn it into a manageable condition? What, it depends what you mean by cure. So like a pill that just makes it go away or, cause yeah, I think for me, there's only really one real cure is stopping it, it getting into the next generation. And that's why I'm a huge advocate for PGD, IVF or, um, and and plan and uh planning because that is a foolproof way to cut it off um i foresee hd becoming something like aids and hiv where people are hd positive their whole life but they have treatments that stop them ever getting huntington's disease in the same way if you're hiv positive now it's not a death sentence anymore because they have the drug drugs and stuff to stop you ever your immune system getting down and that will be a real big thing for that a lot of the work and the research in terms of clinical and translational work that I'm interested in and, and a lot of the stuff that we do in our clinical team at UCL is focusing on young people and young gene carriers and far from onset to really build our tool set to to design these kind of studies um, and yeah it's just it's a big question mark for even the current trials are we starting too late um, I think it's a big question that's coming out in a lot of neurodegenerative disease studies like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, that I have had huge debates over what 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 play, thing they should target in terms of the, the disease the pathology of these diseases um, but uh, it could be that they just started too late you know in, in terms of treatment but that has its own problems in terms of trying to design studies of people that don't have symptoms is has a huge um, load in terms of you need to have huge numbers of patients 
follow them for a lot longer to get an end point. So it's not really an undertaking that's going to be thought done in the first instance. That's why they need to do these kind of studies and see what data. It could be that the Roche program continues in another looking into this kind of thing. Um, but that will depend on what they seen from the data. If there was a huge safety problem or risk, then they might not, but it's an, it's a possibility. Yeah, and like on what Lauren said um, about all that, like I do get the, I know a lot of like diseases, they have a lot of manageable treatments that, you know, just delay or hide it for so long until it doesn't anymore. And although like that seems great at the time, it's it's not a proper solution. It's like a, a metaphor putting, you know, a bandaid on a, an open wound. It can only hold it for so long. And the a re really big important thing about that for what Lauren said is, it's like we we're like you're born with HD. You don't you know don't just get it, and you know we have a threshold, and that's why our our onset is later on in life. That's why we're not we don't have an onset per se when we're born. So there's obviously a threshold within the body that can handle it for so long. So trying to find I think that's a really big point with the ASOs. Like we need to we need to have an output for the drug so we know what to measure on if it's working or not. And if you have like pre manifest how do you necessarily know it's helping a symptom that's not there yet? So that's a lot of, I think, like imaging studies and it's, it's a whole different route. So it's just, a, it's a whole load of work that like we're still trying to figure out what's the best time, how do you, what's the best measure? And because you need it, you need huge numbers because we are all so different that it, it just, it takes a really big undertaking. So I see, you know, we have so much potential with these ASOs and we have so many things to do with them to see where best and when best to use them and that itself are masses and masses of projects and as easy as it sounds it's not and that's where like our time conflicts come in that like we envision that being a long time to figure it out but to figure out the best way whereas the other side is like okay well that sounds easy let's do it now and that's where I think the disparity becomes between how we're trying to get the research in the lab into clinical trials and trying to make sure like the patients are happy and getting what they want, but the time is very difficult. And I know what you mean by saying, can you just get treatments to treat the symptoms? But you, you, with a disease like this that progresses, you have a time, a time frame for this. And it's nearly going through it twice if you, you take something to alleviate some symptoms, but they come right back soon again. I think it's almost like a false sense. So I think they not, the, Therapies now are not curing, they're modifying and delaying onset so much that you shouldn't experience it before you'd, you know, hopefully die of something else, like like us average Joes. So anything, anything other than this is the goal. But like right now is the, the plan is to delay as long as possible so that you have a quality of life and a lifespan that is no different than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, Heather and Lauren, you've done a fantastic job of explaining why things take take a long time. And I think it's really put it into context what, why, you know, say wave three, um, you know, we should be hopeful for that. It's not just them saying like, like um, you know, we asked before, it's not just them saying, oh, we, we hope this because, you know, we're a pharma company, we want to make money. No, like we, we genuinely are hopeful for that. And I think that's really helped. I just wondered if that's okay with everyone, if we can touch on um, other uh, studies as well. And I know what was really um, good was as many others, um, but Unicure, who have their gene therapy um, treatment, um, just put out a statement just to say that they're still continuing work um in their study there earlier on in the process you know how we talked about um lauren explained that wave were in uh 1a 2b and we know roche were in what we call phase three so unicure you know is still early um but again gene therapy that they're using is again a different it's a it's a completely different treatment it's not an aso um so there's there's other hope there as well um, and there's lots of gene therapy being used in other studies, um, which has, you know, really been beneficial uh, for patients. Uh, so I don't know, Lauren and Heather, I don't, obviously you don't know everything about Unicure study, but I don't know if you want to comment on that from a gene therapy point of view, uh, why it's different, maybe why it takes longer, because they've done a lot more animal studies 
from my understanding than what um, we have with the ASOs. So I guess uh, one way to think about the gene therapy and Unicure's approach, it's like a level up in terms of complexity again, you know, from ASOs. I think one of the reasons why ASOs are um, it being used and designed for, for brain diseases is, is that a lumbar function is relatively um, well tolerated and it's a way we can get straight into the brain um, to target the brain. Um, it's not um, for a thing that we're not sure whether or not it's going to be safe or not having something that you can stop um, and then the effect of the drug goes away is is probably a good place to start with in terms of lowering Huntington in the brain, which we know, as we've said before, it might be important um, to keep the Huntington there. Um, so what Unicure are doing are using um, so viruses, um, there's lots of different types, but they have this ability to get into cells um, and kind of use this, the factory and, and the machinery of our cells to make their own um, RNA or DNA so they can replicate themselves. And, and that, that's a kind of natural phenomenon. And in science, uh, very smart scientists have been able to <laughs> hijack this machinery of viruses and use that to kind of deactivate the virus part of it, but then kind of insert some uh, RNA or DNA that we want it to create. So it allows, what, what Unicure are doing is specifically creating a, what we call a, um, a, a silencing RNA or a small interferon RNA, sorry. Um, what? Yeah, SNR. RNA, SNR, yeah. I was just trying to figure out what the S and I is. <laughs> we're, we're just speaking acronyms constantly, yeah. so you forget Lawrence what the actual... Very good with acronyms. Yeah. Yeah, this <laughs> is complicated does. stuff, guys. It's complicated for Well, us. I mean, <laughs> I know what it does. It's just a No, I know. Name, but, um, <laughs> I'm joking. It's very similar to an ASO in, in the fact that it binds... It's got a specific sequence of letters that are designed to target a specific part of the Huntington protein. And the binding of it causes the degradation of that, the Huntington, and then it lowers how much of the protein it's made. So it's a very similar concept to ASOs in terms of that. But what is unique about this and why it's called a gene therapy is that we're using the, the, the virus and vector machinery to insert that gene into these cells. So the cells produce the medicine themselves. And then just the, produce this siRNA to lower the Huntington. So that means it's got a long, it's a kind of more of a permanent um, effect in the cells that it get the, the drug get or the the viruses get into. And this, they're specifically injecting it into the brains of, of people and into the the very specific part of the brain that is most affected in in Huntington's disease very early on. It's called the striatum. Um, and so it's hugely complex. It's involving um, very specialist um, neurosurgeons and um, specialist MRI scans. They can. In, in, there's been a lot of development in terms of the method of delivery and how that gets into the it gets um, get the drug the viruses across the whole the putium in. So it's very local in terms of how where the, the viruses can get into and where then the factories, the cells um, that make the, the drug is. So it's not going to affect um, get to the whole brain. Um, so that's some of the differences. Um, but it's the permanence as well of it. So mm -hmm. it's hugely exciting. It's a big undertaking. Um, and they're currently in a phase one study, which is purely looking at safety um of this whole method and they are grad they're doing what very similar to how the ASO trial started and doing a um multiple ascending dose so they've just said that their first dose or this low dose I think is complete and they're just checking the data of that before they go to the next higher dose but so <laughs> far so good so they are pretty optimistic about their program um and yeah it's exciting and there's you know, there's tons of other um, companies as well that have different approaches. Some are 
or even looking at things called small molecules. And these are things that we could take as a pill and they can penetrate the, the brain. Um, so there's at least two companies I know that have their own um, small molecules that are either um, close to starting or going into kind of um, yeah, so Novartis well, the one, I believe. I'm not sure who the other one is, but PTC, yeah. PTC, um, PTC Therapeutics definitely have a small molecule. And yep. then I think there's other companies, I think Shire, um, or have a collaboration with another company, but they are doing a different kind of hunting and lowering that would target the DNA. Um, and that's again a The freeze. ones that are target the RNA. Um, did I freeze? Yeah, yeah you froze, froze a bit yeah. there, but you're back now. Did it, what did you just get? <laughs> we heard they're so. targeting the DNA, and then you went. Yeah, uh, and we missed so we, the targeting of the DNA is a slightly more um, permanent effect or um, potent effect than just looking at the RNA as well, because it changed the DNA or the instructions to make the proteins in our cells. So if you change the the core instructions then after that then you know anything that cell makes will make what you've changed it to like for like seeds and like when you like grow you know you can make like mixed rows with different pips and seeds like from there that's the core so if you change anything with the seed you'll get a different like you know if you get like an apple oh. things like this and that's the whole basis of it and what the most important thing about what lauren is saying is that like our asos are their delivery method has to be through the cerebral spinal fluid because our brain is encased in a barrier that protects it from any agents and viruses to its best ability so as daunting as it sounds to inject into the brain it's often better to have a, a local reaction instead of having your whole body because it has, has more to fight to to get to the area that you need than whether you just put it in the directly into the area that's that's most vulnerable to the disease and if it's in the phase one, that's like really great. That obviously the first thing we're going to do is make sure that this method is safe. And it's as daunting as it sounds, like no one's going to get an injection in the brain that's going to cause any harm. So that's, I think that's an important thing. And for viruses, they also sound scary, especially now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the most important thing is, is how, it also helps you to understand it, how quick that gets in and how quick it gets around that's what we want from the virus. We want, we take out their DNA and their, what they want you to do to the cell. We keep their, basically their runners on them and we put, well, we want them to put it into the cell in them. So we just change their insides, keep their Nike trainers on and let them leg it to the body like, and that's how it gets in so much. Yeah. And a lot of the work that's gone in different fields is like uh, tweaking these viruses and their cases so they're better at getting into to brain cells rather than your skin cells or you know so it's really there's so much work that's gone over the years to kind of in really cool technologies that um that it, it's exciting that there's even a gene therapy happening in, in Huntington yeah. so with our cells, no definitely we know that our cells have different um, molecules on the outside to tell viruses what they are so that's how they can maybe target specific to a brain cell because that'll have a different coat on it than a skin cell and that's how it helps target it to the right, the right place. No, definitely. And injecting into the brain, um, again, as Heather said, might be scary. However, for example, um, in some eye diseases, um, they inject the gene therapy into the eye. So it's a similar um, principle that's been used in, in other disease areas as well. So that's not that's not a brand new brew thing. I think we just find it a bit more scary because it's your brain than it is your eye, for example. Um, I'm just wondering in the last... Uh, eight minutes or so. Um, obviously, uh, we as scientists, uh, we have, um, you know, hope and we know how long these things take. But I wanted to touch on, um, it's really tough for people who've maybe tested positive, well, for everybody, I should say, for everybody who just say, but there's been a lot of conversation on social media that, you know, people who maybe thought, oh, well, I've tested positive, but hopefully I'm not symptomatic for, I don't know, 15 years now, I was really hopeful for these treatments. Um, or maybe they they might be symptomatic in you know a few years, or maybe they've just just become symptomatic. Um, is there any is there any um, I guess reassurance or support? I mean that we could um, su suggest because that that's quite a tough um, time at the moment. Hello. 
Who is that aimed at? Is it me? Or... Just, just anybody. <laughs> um, Matt, maybe you'll be first. Um... I mean, yeah, it's 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 a rough time. Um, and you know, if anybody wants to chat and or have a chat, then anytime we're here, it's not a problem at all. Just send us a, an email and a message. We're here to help. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's not a problem at all. Obviously, each person's going to handle it their own way um, and handle this kind of news their own way. And it, it's it's difficult to know how how people will cope with, with these kind of things. Um, and it really comes back to Leslie's kind of question uh, earlier about uh, curing Huntington's disease. Um, or is it that we're looking for, you know, delaying it and, and I think I think that's probably always been the case that we are looking for delaying it and not curing it outright um of course we'd love to just wipe it away with with something amazing but I think what we're seeing what these treatments are the rush treatment waste treatment the future ones coming out as well um is that they're, we're hoping to to just kind of delay uh mm-hmm. onset of HD as much as we can to give people as much happy and healthy life as they can. Um, and But what gives people hope is probably that word cure. And it's, uh, a lot of people use it uh, to kind of, sort of express that, you know, this is going to solve everything. And it's uh, it doesn't really work that way. And we're seeing it right this week. We're seeing it and we're seeing it hard. And it doesn't really work that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is still hope as well, of course. Um, and I think what I'd, what I'd say as well, because I've been thinking about this a lot, obviously reading um, a lot of the posts and trying to um, think about that a lot more. I think there's several stages. And I know, as Matt said, you know, if we, we think of this cure, it feels like it's a really long way away again. Um, I know this doesn't help necessarily right now, but there's several stages. You know, if we're talking about quality of life, you know, there's the support system. So so we're here for everybody and a lot of the other HD organizations, particularly now, and we're always going to be, you know, here to, to talk to. And then you've got, you know, practical things that you can do as well. I know that's not necessarily helpful, but if we maybe take a step back from thinking about the cure, and then we've got obviously movement um, drugs that can help some of the motor symptoms which are they're still they're still being developed to be more effective and then we obviously have the um um and antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication um which are not huntington specific but they can have effects on people's quality of life as well and i know right now some people some people don't want to hear this but it's um it's more of a step it's like going up a flight of flight of stairs and there's different things that can help us on the way and although the, the cure might seem, or the, the gene therapy something that only needs to be dosed once or, you know, doesn't need to be dosed much at all, and that's, that's it, then that might seem further away. But we still have lots of other, I guess, uh, as, as Dr. Bonnie says, t- tools in our toolkit that we have on the way to get there. So I just, um, I know people are going to feel like they don't have hope, but I hope um, people still have some some hope in the community we're in right now. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything to that. I would just add um, in any case, you know, being the healthiest, um, happiest you can be in your situation is going to be the best way to succeed and and try with Huntington's or life in general and the trials. It's easier to say when you don't have Huntington's. um, But um, you know, the effect of, you know, staying healthy and, you know, drinking less and um, exercise more, do yoga, you know, get do um, mindfulness is get a therapist before you have psychiatric treatment, you know, like be as happy as you can be. Um, it will help a lot. Um, I would also say, don't be getting involved in a trial if you're expecting it to make your Huntington's better. I, I think that's harsh, but um, it that it's a trial for a reason. It's a big undertaking and you need to really know that um, and not expect it to be curing your Huntington's disease. Um, it's going to be amazing when we have a drug that does, and I say when, because I'm, I'm confident we will. 
Um, yes. But that's not, I, I think, I, I know so, have work, working in the clinic and having people phone to try and get their loved ones in these trials as if this is the last hope. And it's really not the people need to realize what it's it, it's a very altruistic thing to take part in a trial because you don't know what the safety risks are you don't know whether there's really any benefit at all it's a, it's a, there's a lot of benefits from taking part of the trial just for in terms of the support and have been con regular contact with people that understand Huntington's disease and having that actual support through it it's a lot of hard work as well and um, particularly something like the Ross trial, which was two years of, of lumbar punctures every uh, couple of months. So it, yeah, that's what I, I would like, want to get people to think about it when it comes to drugs and trials is there's not going to be a quick fix to this, unfortunately. And that is so frustrating. I honestly am there with you guys and I feel it. Um, you know, half my family are all at risk and it, it's, it's really tough. Um, and the one thing I would just keep being engaged, like one thing that HDO are trying to help is get, get the young people and the young generation engaged because that's going to be the way we really fight this. Because I, that's <laughs> what I'm convinced is that if we're going to really delay Huntington's and stop it ever happening, it will be treating long before you ever have symptoms. And I feel really, uh, I believe in that quite strongly, um, mm -hmm. but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of work from both scientists and the family members and community to get to get to that point. Yeah, and we're learning that like none of us can do it single-handedly, like the scientists can't do it, or the, the HG community, the HG community can't do it, or the scientists, and realistically, we're all one. Like we have such a team, like either people affected directly or indirectly, or even the people who, who never knew about Huntington's before they got into research and they're as driven as, as anyone with or without is, you know, ultimately that's what we want. The more people who know about HD or who want to help the better, the more we get answers. And, and it's exactly what Lauren said, like you need to go into a trial, like really open-minded and on the basis that this is for research, that this is to find out an answer uh, like a question so you know you have the question you just want to see how it's going to go like we can't go in being like this is the one um it has to be like level playing field field of that you're going into a trial to contribute something that is unknown and then everything can only be better again like i don't know any you know research that goes backwards and because we can't because we find out the answers whether it's the ones we want or not Usually, most often it's the ones we don't want, but that's how we get to the ones we want because we have to find that out. Mm. So that's and that's how we learn in life as well, isn't it? Unfortunately, but by learning things the, the way we don't want to learn them. Oh yeah, like this, is, this is a nightmare. And this is I, the, the worst possible outcome of a trial, but it's not because it's answers as well. And it's really hard when, you know, for the Roche trial, we don't have all the answers yet to what they've even mm -hmm. found it. Mm -hmm. And that's frustrating because obviously we're like, oh, we go off into our heads and get down a wormhole of maybe it's this or that. And there's no point in doing anything until we have the concrete evidence in front of us. And then we're like, oh, it did X, Y, and Z. Now we know what to do next. Mm -hmm. Still that is, I think we need to just uh, protect ourselves, mind ourselves and just gloss over until we have the facts. Like, yeah, yeah there's no point in dwelling on something we don't know enough about yet. And absolutely, as updates go, it's nearly more frustrating that they have to tell us before they can give us all the answers because we have all the what ifs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, it's horrendous. The way they've had to announce these things, it, it's just, yeah. I mean, what That's I'll end on is that, you know, we are still in a good position. <laughs> and I said the same last week, but, and then we lost that one. <laughs> um, but no, we are still in a good position. and. We are fortunate in a way to have what we have um, in the Huntington's community. We have the organization CHCI, which has put so much money into research and really pushed it along. Yeah. You know, we found the gene decades ago with the help of the, the Wexer family and the research that the other researchers involved in that did. It was amazing. So, and we've got all of these farm companies now getting stuck in and, you know, we are, 
we've had we've had some failures in the past couple of weeks, uh, which has kind of I guess it's brought us back down uh, a bit in terms of becoming a bit more realistic about when we can expect these treat treatments to arrive. Um, but we still have to be hopeful. Um, we're still fortunate to be in this position, and a lot of communities would would love to have the support and resources that we do right now for research. So. We've got to be thankful about that and just keep doing what we do and just keep participating in the next trials that are coming up. No, definitely. And a massive thank you to um, Lauren and Heather for their time tonight. If anyone has any further questions, um, we're all part of the board. Um, so we're so lucky to have them as part of our board and obviously Matt as our staff. So we're still, we're still here. So ask any questions you've got because we'll be here to support you and answer them as best we can. I echo that. Thank you, Heather and Lauren. Appreciate that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time and thank you for your good questions. night, good afternoon. Yeah, wherever you Bye, are. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care, everyone. <laughs>